Hello and welcome on The Barricades. This is a podcast produced by Eastern European journalists and academics, and I am your host, Maria Cernat, an academic based in Bucharest, and with me as usual, the co-host of the show, the Bulgarian-born Polish journalist, Bojan Stanislavski. Thank you for being here with us. Absolutely. Thanks. So, Boyan, we were discussing a lot about right-wing populists uh, and uh, the rise of right-wing populists in Eastern Europe. We discussed the situation in Romania. And I'm very curious to find out what are your points of view with regards to what I presented and also what is the situation in Bulgaria, since Bulgaria seems to be a little bit different than Romania in terms of its relation to Russia since the languages are closer, the culture might be closer than that of Romania and Russophobia is not so high as it is in Romania. No, so please no. go ahead. All right. Of course, well, before I speak about Bulgaria and maybe uh, make some references to Poland, I want to say that uh, you spoke at length uh, during the previous segment about the situation in Romania, using it as an example to sort of try and, and, and give us a basis for both of us here to analyze uh, Eastern European right-wing populism, so to say. And I think it does make sense to analyze it uh, in separate, well, maybe not in separation, not in complete separation, but to also <clears throat> analyze it separately because it's a somewhat different political animal than in the West. I mean, the origins of our uh, right-wing populism are somewhat different because it's all it all boils down to uh, 1989 or early 90s, the restoration of capitalism and the fact that... Uh, you know, simple as that. We were just let down. We were lied to. We were uh, we were mm, we were promised something which we were not getting. We have not been getting, and uh, of course, it produced a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, grievances. <clears throat> and uh, it's a it's a totally natural process. The thing that makes it unique, in my opinion, is that. We are, I mean, especially Bulgaria and Romania, okay? Poland is, again, and Visegrad in general is this region, <clears throat> north, northern part, the northern part of Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary. I mean, this is, this is Visegrad. This is, this is not exactly the same as Bulgaria and Romania in many aspects, okay? But all across the region, we have seen right-wing populism, what is referred to as right-wing populism, on the rise, thriving, you know, I, in Poland, they were actually ruling, you know, in Hungary, they were actually ruling, right? Uh, they are, uh, they just became the right-wing, you know, nationalist, populist, whatever movements, uh, they, they just became the third parliamentary force in Bulgaria. So this is important, right? And this, this is not just like some nationalists raising nationalistic slogans, you know, trying to appeal to backward intuitions of, of the people and this is how how they became the, <clears throat> those important political factors of course this is very uh this would be very ignorant to to approach it this way although that's unfortunately the dominating narrative if you read the guardian for example what they write about right-wing populism in poland or bulgaria that's that's just ridiculous crap uh so uh yeah that's that's by and large a backlash you know, a backlash reaction to uh, uh, to uh, to everything that's happened over the last 30 years or almost 30 years throughout the region. We were promised, and I, I want to stress on that, we were promised as societies that things are going to be, all the, all the economic stability that, that has been developed during the times of uh, people's republics, that's what the socialist countries called themselves officially People's Republic of Poland, People's Republic of Bulgaria, right? So the People's Republic, they brought some kind of stability. And you can discuss, okay? I, I understand it's disputable for some people uh, whether this stability was like on a on a level high enough just kind of for people to appreciate it. Well, you know, one way or another, they did appreciate it. And they wanted to, to keep that stability. So they were promised, guys, no worries. We're going to jump right into capitalism and you're going to keep your stability, everything, you know, the social welfare, the healthcare system, free education, you know, cheap culture, if you like, uh, cheap meaning accessible, not cheap that it was bad. Uh, it's actually much worse now than it used to be before, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, that, that was all going to remain, you know, be in place. And on top of that, we we're going to get some additional things 
especially uh especially in terms of especially in terms of um consumer products like yeah, we were gonna is. get we were gonna get all those shiny things that the westerner mm -hmm. had access to and unfortunately because of the decadence of the system and our you know obsession with heavy industry we were not able to get all those shiny things and unfortunately they turned out to be just that shiny things you know fact of the matter is we were not able to get certain things as shiny and of as you know of, of um how to say this uh it's not only about them being shiny but also about them providing you a kind of concept of comfort that was not really part of our political cultures Commodity fetishism, right? Commodity fetishism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a very good term to bring up here. But also, you know, there was this famous, and I, it speaks volumes about, you know, the, the culture of Eastern European culture of everyday lives and Western European culture of everyday lives, okay? We've had this famous discussion between Khrushchev, the guy who took over after Joe Stalin died in the Soviet Union. Mm, so Khrushchev met with some American, I, I don't know whether he was an American president or an important American bureaucrat, or I, I just cannot remember the anecdote exactly, but they met during some kind of international fair, okay, where the American was presenting an electrical lemon squeezer, okay, was presenting, like, saying to Khrushchev, look, this is an electrical lemon squeezer. Now, you can cut the lemon in half, you can put it there, and, you know, the electrical kind of you know, engine there would kind of turn uh, the squeezer on and then the juice would you know, be, be produced that way. And Khrushchev was looking at it with almost disdain. And he said, why are you doing this? I mean, it's such a nonsense. Every house, housewife in the Soviet Union knows that you can just cut the lemon in half, squeeze it with your hand, and you get just the same effect. You know, so this is, but, 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 you realize how appealing, I mean, now in retrospect, we realize even more how appealing it was like, you know, they have electrical lemon, electrical lemon squeezers, you know, and, and cars which look better than ours because we were only able to produce Trabant and Vadburg and Lada and stuff like that, or Dacia in the case of Romania, right? Yes. So, yes. yeah, yeah. So we, the hope was, and the understanding, the perception was that, yeah, we're going to take part in it. In the whole, you know, protest, revolution, as they called it at the time. No revolution, counter-revolution, if anything, honestly, according to my opinion, okay? Like, I, I don't know whether you would agree with it. But uh, we were promised this, and we were not getting it. And, like, people were patient for some time. But then finally, you know, there's only a given amount of damage, destruction, and destitution people can take. You know, unless, of course, you install some kind of fascistic dictatorship that drives down living standards under uh, in, in, in conditions of dictatorship or totalitarian dictatorship, if you like. And uh, that has not occurred so far, you know, which is great. But the driving down of living standards, yes, that had occurred. And, uh, you know, there are even American, if you like, sources and uh, analytical um, research uh programs you can you know look to uh, you can see the reports uh where even american analysts looking at bulgaria for example they would say uh they they, they actually did say uh they'd conclude that the civilizational downgrade that we went through is definitely compatible comparable with results of a major war having been lost OK, yes. so we're talking about warlike trauma. OK, warlike trauma. Actually, you know, it should be surprising that people of many Eastern European countries, especially those that were on the receiving end of the worst kind of economic violence that had occurred over the last 30 years or that has. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so that they are not revolting. You know, that they are not on the streets every day uh, uh, and, and, and are not are not violently reacting um, against or are not carrying out this backlash in a violent manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's that's just as simple as that. And, and th the thing that makes it unique, in my opinion, is the absence of the left. That's what's unique, because when you look at all the conditions that were created 
during the years, especially the early years of the restoration of capitalism in various countries, then you will easily see that the common denominator is super fast, speed light pauperization of large masses of people. Now, what happens normally, quote unquote, when you get this kind of situation? Working class people getting uh, you know, downgraded economically, culturally, uh, getting deprived of uh, their savings, their wealth, their, you know, being uh, forced to, uh, uh, to, uh, to endure all kinds of hardships, being laid off massively. W what happens then? Well, normally you should have leftist organization, leftist parties, trade unions, labor movement, you know, on the rise, leading the protests, trying to <coughs> stop those, again, quote unquote, reforms, right? But none of it, none of it happened. Now, we can discuss, we can have an endless discussion, okay, about whether, you know, to what extent the left itself in Eastern Europe actually is responsible for it, uh, for its own failure. Uh, to what extent, you know, they are victims of the pressure, ideological pressure, you know, cultural, economic, you know, all kinds of pressure, anti-communism, rampant anti-communist ideology, uh, the kind of... Uh, agitation, propaganda in exactly in the field of culture, you know, Hollywood uh, and, uh, and, and, and Western lifestyle, you know, music, you know, all the rest of it, which actually was a big part of the propaganda uh, in 89 or early 90s. You know, remember Wind of Change, right? What a nonsensical BS, like when you come to think about it today. They should be ashamed of having written that song and, and, and they should be ashamed of having made it a hit. Today, if they are, you know, if there is any intellectual honesty in the heads of those people, you know, the Scorpions, the band, the German band, uh, what a ridiculous nonsense, right? So, uh, or, or maybe, no, that was actually a genuine wind of change, but I mean, that was, the wind was not blowing in the direction where they would describe it. No, as no, song, no. Not, not much, no, right? but so, it's, I would just, just say here that it, it was so seductive and the working class still, I think in Romania, part of the working class still dreams of becoming Bezos, not yeah. a union <clears throat> leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, they that's what I'm... Uh, that, they really think they can become somehow um, Jeff <laughs> Bezos or some other billionaire and they are more uh, by the idea of becoming a billionaire, they are seduced by the idea of becoming a union of course. leader. Of course, of course. And and again, here we can have an endless discussion whether they are responsible for the choices that they make, political choices, including in their individual daily life, uh, and to what extent it's the pressure of the propaganda. I think it's a mixture of both, but and, and we cannot just go ahead and dismiss, you know, neither of the factors. But in the final aftermath, you know, you as an individual human being, you carry the responsibility for the political choices that you make. You carry the responsibility for thinking that you can become Jeff Bezos, despite the fact that it's a ridiculous idea on its face. Uh, you carry the responsibility for, uh, you know, falling for, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all those shiny little things that Western culture gives you, which are just a complete uh, and utter crap. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I will. I'm not a liberal, okay. I, <laughs> I'm not a liberal, but I'm really very attached to the notion of individual responsibility. Although, of course, I recognize the objective factors to use the Marxist language. Uh, but then, you know, let's go back to the question of the left. So the left has been, okay, pressured, totally, yeah, of course, mocked. Yeah, I know, I know. But still, you know, no one has ever promised the left. I don't know where they're getting it from. That politics is some kind of safe space, and that you're going to have the same rights. Like, you know, the right wingers are dominating, the big capital is dominating, uh, the, uh, you know, the capitalist class is, 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 is much stronger. They have the media, they have the judiciary, they have the army, they have the police, right? I mean, the state is capitalist, is, like all the states that, we, that, that, are, that mm -hmm. you can see now in Eastern Europe, they're all capitalist states. So obviously this is not going to be easy for you. Where did you get this from? Well, here's the answer. Where did, you, where, where did they get it from? Because during the previous 50 years or almost 50 years, the left didn't have to confront anyone. They really didn't have to confront anyone. And, and when you look at people, when you look at those people like Gorbachev and stuff, they were very naive, okay? Yes, Again, that incredible. doesn't free... Incredibly. Yeah, okay, but, 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 yeah and incredibly naive. Why? Because they didn't have any confrontation. They didn't have... Politics was just like... like uh, 
And well, I don't want to say that it was child's, child's play because that would be an exaggeration, but it was a very easy thing. It was more of a of, of management practice than, you know, actual struggle. And uh, again, we can discuss about like the nature of the Soviet Union and stuff like that, but this is the case by and large, okay, throughout Eastern Europe, throughout the Soviet bloc, Eastern bloc, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that this is where this uh, culture uh, comes from. And this, of course, unfortunately, was, uh, you know, it, it, it could have only produced failure. Because when you are on the left, then, you know, the nature of leftist politics is to struggle. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, let's now talk a little bit about, about how actually those countries did become safe space for some people and how they have benefited from it and how they have bought in to the propaganda, to the agitation, to, you know, the new lifestyle and the new ideologies, which is most important, and how they have, how they have helped legitimizing them, despite the fact that those ideologies, like I told you, uh, the kind of Western concept of what it, mean, what it means to have a good, happy life were completely different than those in Eastern Europe. So how, how did this happen? Well, in 1989 or early 90s, okay, in some cases, in Bulgaria, for example, we haven't had capitalism until pretty much 1992. Uh, and only then we started, you know, getting capitalist reforms. And only in 1997, when the West couldn't stand it anymore that we're not privatizing enough, then they carried out a colored revolution and they, they, they enforced this, this thing that we have to endure <clears throat> you know, until now, like capitalist neoliberal uh, model. So uh, for some people, it did get better. It really did get better. Not for many, but for some, it did get a lot better, especially those who uh, had enough wealth to travel to see the world, to start kind of exploring, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, variety of the European culture. At the time, things were totally different, okay? Like in Europe, in the West, the West before austerity, before 2007, the West after that is like two completely different realities. I'm talking Western Europe here. I mean, I don't know about the US, Canada, Australia. I, I presume it's the mm -hmm. same, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I, can, I can definitely see a change though <clears throat> in the realities uh, in France, Britain, Germany, uh, uh, Italy. So, uh, so for them, things started getting better. They were able to buy cars, Western cars, which were better. Let's be honest. I mean, they were better than Eastern European cars. Okay, uh, and uh, they were able to purchase electric lemon squeezers, and they were like, "Wow, <laughs> you know." So things were, and and jeans they, and Coca Cola and McDonald's. And all oh, the no, rest. So, sorry. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was available in Bulgaria since the late 60s. Okay, just... just in Romania, that. only Pepsi. Uh, in Romania, <laughs> you see, yeah. So, uh, well, which actually is a very good point, because that means that our... It's not like our economies were completely locked. Locked in. Like, you know, no, no Western influence, no Western uh, consumer goods and stuff like that. But they were able to go to, to, you know, the neighboring Austria from, I don't know, Romania or Czech Republic or something, and they were able to get, ah, you know, electrical lemon squeezer. So I'm not blaming the people. I, you know, I understand that they were just, they got carried away, okay? I, I understand this. But again, in the final aftermath, you got to look at it in an intellectually and morally very honest manner. You were lied to. I mean, this electrical lemon squeezer, what are you going to do with it like today? <laughs> I mean, what kind of thing does it, yeah, does it, or, or, I mean, how does it make your life better? Or how, how would your life be worse without it? Would you be really worse off? No, not not so much, I believe. So now, what did it, what kind of what kind of ideological consequence did it have? Well, it produced a whole layer of people within the societies uh, of Eastern European states. I would I would guess around 20, 20 to thirty percent of people, okay, that started believing even more in it and they started to make an ideology out of it and that was of course helped you know by all those factors which i mentioned not least hollywood tv you know western tv stations western western media uh and westernization basically of the public sphere to the extent that it was possible uh and uh, and those people 
they started to to become the ideological and civic vanguards of those people who were actually behind the st- behind the scenes accumulating capital, who were carrying out the to use the Marxist term primitive accumulation of capital. Okay, but but of course you you, you couldn't see them, or maybe very occasionally. But those the rich and powerful, those who became the rich and powerful, the demoralized late communist quote unquote nomenclatura you know, the high party, mm-hmm. high ranking party officials, the secret services, you know, the high ranking policemen, the army generals, retired army generals and stuff like that. Those who actually became the owners, okay, the economic owners of our countries, you you wouldn't be able to see them walking around our neighborhoods, right? They, you know, no, like today, no. like today, you know, imagine, I don't know, imagine America, like do Carnegie's and DuPont's and Rockefeller's today walk around the neighborhoods like, you know, of regular everyday people? No, of course not. Right. So the capitalism, the new system, the new ideology needed this ideological civic basis. So it needed to somehow like those people who are going to confront with the rest of the society that was that was getting more and more reluctant because they were on the receiving end of the of violence and they didn't have those opportunities to silence to silence their own uh, disappointments with flashy, shiny things that they would be able to get from, I don't know, jeans from Austria, lem- electrical lemon squeezers from wherever, you know, expensive perfume from France and all the rest of it, right? So yeah. it created, it created this mass of people. Uh, some of them recruited, uh, some of them rec- would be, some so it wasn't really a class in itself because within this group within the social group you would have elements of of working class elements petty bourgeois or early petty bourgeois elements you know all kinds of people like even you know peasantry to the extent that like former directors or former managers of big kolhoz like uh farms you know state owned previously and so on and so forth right so that was that was important to have it. And those people, you know what they I, I will I can give you an anecdote uh, which perhaps describes it very well, what kind of people they became. Well, I had a I had numerous discussions with those people, by the way, in Poland, Bulgaria, in many places, but I remember in particular one discussion which I've had in Poland when I still it was late 90s, I was still a member of a youth organization of uh, the Polish Socialist Party. And uh, a non-existent one. I mean, it exists formally, but it doesn't have any meaning uh, anymore. Uh, but, but at the time, it was a pretty popular polit- political organization, social democratic, but very interesting. And uh, <clears throat> and we, uh, you know, as activists, young activists, we confronted many people on the streets while giving leaflets. You know, those were the days where we actually made politics on the streets, not like on the squares, not not in the internet. Uh, so you would, uh, and people would tell you things, would want to discuss with you. And we did discuss. It was uh, it was very interesting, very educa- uh, educational kind of experience. And I remember having discussed with a guy my age at the time, like I was, say, 19, and they were 20 or 21 or something <laughs> like that. We were both students. And uh, I actually convinced him of everything, you know, of everything we stood for, although he declared himself in the beginning of the conversation as a right winger, you know, free market and stuff like that. And then he said he was kind of scratching his head, trying to figure out what the difference actually is. And then he said, I know the difference between you and me is that I believe in the European project. I believe in the transition. And I was like, what does it even mean? You believe in the European project? What, is it? what does it mean to believe? Like, what, you, you hang the European flag. We haven't had it then, but, you know, just for the sake of, of sort of. Uh, giving you the, the the idea that I had in my response, like what well, you you put you, this this flag, European flag or whatever, like over your bed, you light a little candle. So what do you do with it, right? Like what do you mean you believe? You pray? <laughs> you know you're not supposed to believe. This is not politics. This is not. I mean, this is not religion. This is supposed to be politics. You should be questioning all the time. That's what you should be doing, right? And this is this. This is the same like, what do you mean you believe in transition? The facts are here. It destroyed us. Back then, it was much worse than now, right? So there was much more discontent yes, in, in the late 90s, 90s okay? Oh. So what do you mean you believe in this? Like, So he explained that uh, they believe that finally things are going to get better, which is, again, like, yeah. what? And this is, this is the trick that the system has produced 
Like it made people believe, you know, that, okay, well now things are different. Uh, now things are dire, but like in the final aftermath, sometime later in, 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 you know, in a few years, then in a few decades now, I don't know, in, in, in uh, ages from now, maybe things are going to get better. And they were getting worse and worse, but they still kept believing, you know, they kept, yeah, okay, it's temporary, you know, it's going to get better. They kept believing. And th the idea that they will eventually, you know, finish management studies and they will become, well, maybe not Jeff Bezos, but they, they're going to start earning, I don't know, the equivalent of $10,000 a month or something like that. That's what actually produced this sentiment and helped it spread throughout the society with the support of the so-called, quote unquote, civic society organizations, all those, you know, NGO, the, the entire NGO mafia, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's how the mindset, the kind of the, that was the first and rather successful attempt to change the political, cultural DNA of the people in Eastern Europe. Okay. They still haven't, but, but now coming back because we've got five minutes left, Coming back to the question of right-wing populism, this is where reality asserts itself. This is where reality knocks on your door and says, no, guys, you did manage to destroy the cultural fabric, the civilizational, even if you like, fabric of those societies to a large extent through economic repression, through political ideology and propaganda and stuff like that. You did manage to do that, but you did not manage to change the DNA of the people. No. What they want is something else than you kept offering them. And they cannot, like, you just cannot break them. I mean, not that way. You would have to actually install fascistic, fascist, straight up fascist dictatorships in order to repress hundreds of thousands of people in order to break the backbone the cultural civilization or whatever you want to refer to it, social background of those, uh, backbone, sorry, of those societies. That's what you would have to do. And they still can't. They can't because they, they, they don't have the capacity to do that. <clears throat> so, although I, I'm sure they would love, they'd love to. And this is where right-wing populism yes. comes in. Absence of the left and failed attempts to convince the societies that, that we should all be like the Americans, like the French, like the Germans. We don't want to be that. They believe that. And those people, those 25, 30% of the society we spoke about them, by the way, in a few programs ago about, you know, people hating their own nations, because this is how you where, where you end up when you get ideologically obsessed. You hate everyone around you. Right. Because because we don't want to be like the Americans deep down. It's the Americans and the European elite, all the Ursulas von der Leyen and stuff. They deeply they are deeply convinced that in every Bulgarian, every Romanian, every Moldovan, every Ukrainian, every Belarusian, even every Russian and Chinese there is this Westerner dreaming being suppressed. And they, that, they really, they, they are victims of their own propaganda. That's totally not true. And the reality is giving them a proof of how untrue this is. But they still don't want to accept it because they are so ideologically obsessed. And, you know, those, this, is, this is something that, uh, that those people, the right-wing populists, those parties, those organizations are representing in a very confused manner, sometimes comical, sometimes dangerous, you know, I understand, you know, your reservations and many other people's reservations, but we have to be able to look at it dialectically and see for what it actually is. What is the nature of it? This is a healthy, quote unquote, social reaction. I mean, the backlash is healthy. The execution of that idea is wrong, but the execution of that idea should be disputed politically. If you think, I mean, I'm not talking to you directly, Maria, but just yes, to the yes. left in general who are very scared of, you know, fascism in Bulgaria and Poland. Yeah. Confront them politically. Be a better candidate. Be, convince the masses. You know, uh, this is this is the task ahead of you if you want to prevent them from uh, leading the country if you're so afraid of them. Now, I want to say that I do share some of the reservations you uh, laid out in the previous segment. What is the problem here? Main problem. And, and this is probably the kind of the bottom line here, which I think... Uh, you know, we, we might want to conclude the program on that point, is that there is a question of reasserting the Bulgarian-ness. There is the question of reasserting the Polish-ness. There is the question of reasserting Romanian-ness. I understand fully and I support 
people displaying dignity through political means. Whatever. I, I support people showing their collective middle finger to the establishment. I support, I support that. And I think it's a healthy reaction. But you need an alternative. Like if we want this reaction to be executed in a better political manner, okay, a manner that we will like politically, ideologically, and in, and this is why we're here, right? Like, I mean, to the extent that we can work, we can work through through this program and through uh, all kinds of other events that we organize and our website and stuff. This is all we can do about about it right now. But uh, this is this is a this is a reaction which had to be expected. I mean, I just cannot understand how all the academics, the political elite, you know, all those important, smart people, you know, that they were not able to figure it out. And the danger, the, the, again, to the bottom line, is that, yeah, we are going to reassert ourselves as Bulgarians, for example, with the uh, revival movement, you know, with their party, nationalistic, yeah, totally, you know, right-wing populist, classical, I would even say. Yeah, or we are reasserting our Polishness, if that's even true. I don't think so. With with the law and justice in Poland. And what's what are we going to do afterwards? That's the question. Like, okay, you cannot feed your children with Romanian ness, right? You cannot feed <laughs> yeah. your children with Bulgarian ness. You need to have an economic idea about how how things are going to happen after you take power and how you're going to restructure the economy, the society, because that's what you need. If you don't do that, you will fail. And also, where are there, you know, you, you really need to be a very strong personality and you need to have very good connections with foreign factors in order to maintain power. I, I, I just can't quite see uh, how, for example, the revival movement, if they ever take power, uh, I'm not their supporter or fan or something, but if they ever take power, how are they going to confront a potential colored revolution attempt? I just can't quite see that they can actually survive uh, an experiment like that. But I don't know. I don't know. Now, one thing, an optimistic ending. Okay, let me uh, allow me this. Let's be, let's, let us not be taken over by fear. Okay, because those organizations are, you know, dangerous and they are right wing and, you know, they speak to the, to all kinds of, uh, bigoted, maybe even to some extent, <clears throat> intuitions or elements in our cultures, in our societies. That's that's true. But you know, we've had this party ruling in Poland for the last seven years. We are living in a kind of authoritarian regime, if you like. Well, I hate this word. That's like kind of anarchist nonsense. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like it's just governments, okay? And uh, uh, you know, we we've lived that and. It's it's not really. I mean, it's not good. It's it's not not great. Like in the uh, like the the kind of uh, internet saying, not great, but not terrible, but not great. You know, this is this is exactly the kind of. It's not you know, it's not something that the world is collapsing. That you know, they will unleash the police and the secret services. They're going to arrest every descending voice and stuff. Like, come on, it's not the Third Reich. Okay, it's difficult. It's bad, but it's not something that you have to. You, you should be afraid of like fear, like things are going to now. Yeah. No, what you should do is you should use that period to observe, make conclusions and see what kind of political platform you can build in order to confront them. That's what you should do. And, you know, also there is this possibility. Poland is not an example of that, but there is this possibility. And we've seen that throughout uh, the world that movements which stood for sovereignty, especially in colonial regions, like take the Cuban revolution, for example, or the Venezuelan uh, Chavista revolution, right? They were, I mean, neither Castro nor Chavez were kind of socialist leaders at the beginning. They were, they stood for sovereignty and freedom from imperialism. That's what they stood for. And they were not thinking of socialism, capitalism, and stuff like that. Only through the process of how things started to build, they started acquiring new ideological profile because they were looking at things, thinking, okay, this sucks. It, it's not working for us. We need a major change, Okay. And Marxism is still out there. You know, classical scientific socialism is still out there. It's just, you know, it, it's just for people to look at it and grasp it. So it's not out of question. Uh, I mean, sorry, I, I, I was going to say, yeah, it's not impossible. That's what I meant to say. It's not impossible that those people will change, will change. I don't know if they will become genuine socialists. I really don't know. And I, I don't want to give people false hopes. I'm against preaching hope in general. But I think we should take it into consideration. We should look at it dialectically and we should be able to look at it, as you said, calmly. 
without emotional hype. Let's just analyze it here. Okay, let's say, you know, law and justice is in power, has been in power for seven years. Not, not, not great. Okay, totally not great, but not terrible. Although not great. Okay. And, and, and then, uh, you know, maybe Vazrajdane or revival in Bulgaria, maybe Aur in Romania, maybe they're going to take power for some time. We'll see. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know, like, how the shifts of uh, history and politics, how things are going to go. Maybe something is going to be produced out of those changes that we can actually uh, direct our attention to. It's, it's going to be confused. It's going to be difficult to sort of deal with. But then, you know, think even of, if you like, of the Russian Revolution, the greatest, the greatest socialist event, the, the greatest event in human history, probably. How did it start? With a priest leading a demonstration to beg the Tsar for some kind of stuff. Right. Uh, for some, you know, political demands, social demands. You know. so this is how it all started. So things, you know, started in a very confused manner. But, you know, we, we should not just write them off and just say, oh, these are fascist, backward, stupid people and, and, and align. That, then, of course, the logical consequences we align with liberals. <laughs> that's which okay. is our political enemies. Yeah. So uh, that's that. A very interesting, optimistic ending for the program. Let's hope for the better, prepare for the worst, and hope for the better because this is the rational thing to do. And then again, yes. um, provide rational analysis and not give up to this kind of desperation and you know emotional hype that we've seen so many times, unfortunately, in the mainstream intellectual and political lives in our countries. Thank you so much. And I express again gratitude to the small community of donors that supports us financially and to the extent that you can feel you join you can join us please do because we rely on our support on your support thank you so much boyan thank you to the viewers and we'll see you all in the next segment of our show <laughs>